blessings to you on this All Saints Sunday. Today's message is for my children. How I met your mother. We met in the common area at Delta College for the first time in 1972. This is an area where students would gather and socialize near the cafeteria. Your mom was 18 and I was 19. I was dating your mother's best friend, a beautiful young woman with long black hair. And your mother was dating a friend of mine from the wrestling team. I met your mom's best friend in a physical education volleyball class. Sandy's best friend had a high school boyfriend attending college about 100 miles away, and I had a long distance relationship with another girl about 100 miles away. When Christmas time came around, I said, I know you're going to see your boyfriend and I'm going to see my girlfriend over the holidays so we can get back together and exchange gifts after Christmas. What I should have said was, I'm going to break it off with my girlfriend and you break it off with your boyfriend and we can grow our relationships. But I didn't. And after Christmas, she dumped me. In the summer of 1973, my best friend and his girlfriend dragged me off to a party, and lo and behold, there was Sandy. So that is when your mother and I first started dating. Your mom had been drinking, and boy, was she passionate. I had to go out and buy a turtleneck sweater to hide the marks she left on my neck so my mother wouldn't see them. I gave your mom a pearl promise ring for her birthday in 1974 and then the winter of 74. Sandy's best friend, the one with the long black hair that dumped me, said she wanted to see me again. And I said, I couldn't. I couldn't do that to your mother. I proposed to your mother on her birthday in 1975 and gave her a diamond ring. And we got married in October 75. I almost backed out of the wedding because I just wasn't sure I was making the right move. My mother told me it's just cold feet and everything's going to work out fine. So I went through with it and I married her. We went on our honeymoon to Washington, D.C. and the Blue Ridge Mountains. And we had to cut our trip short because your mom was homesick. I think some of these stories may sound similar to the ones in your lives. I had a five-year plan. No kids for five years while we build up our finances and get us squared away and on our feet. I never told your mother this, but after the first year of marriage, I was contemplating ending it. I had other desires to be independent. I liked partying with my friends and staying out late after work. And then came the bombshell that changed my mind. Honey, I'm pregnant. We are going to have a baby. I'm thinking to myself, what happened to the five-year plan? So my response to Sandy was, oh, great. OK, well, I'm going next door to play cribbage with the neighbors, so I'll be back later. But I was not backing out of this marriage now because I will not let our child grow up with divorced parents. Sandy and I started going back to church because we felt it was important that you were given a Christian education and learn moral values. 
Then a little over two years later, we had another child. I did not make it easy on your mother either. I worked so many hours trying to provide for our family. At nights and weekends, I also drove the tow truck for extra money. But I still found time to meet with my friends after work. Then we moved to Florida in 1987, and that brought your mother and I closer together. I had no one else to depend on. We just had each other. I had always loved Sandy, but never really was in love with her until we got to Florida. One of the first things we looked for was a church with a school, and that's what brought us to our Savior, was the school. This was important to us. We needed a place to worship and for our children to go to school. But the tuition was too high for our budget and we could only afford to send my daughter to school here and my son went to public school. Life was hard that first year in Florida, but I worked hard and excelled at my job and was rewarded many times over. I always pushed myself to the, be the best in everything. Never give up, never quit. In 1995, your mother had a heart attack. She was 41. We went to the emergency room three different times before the doctors finally figured out what was wrong. Sandy had a blockage where two blood vessels came together in a Y on her heart. So they couldn't put a stent in and they had to do open heart surgery for a double bypass. Pastor Bowles came to the hospital and prayed with us. And with tears running down my face, I said to your mother, don't you die on me, you fight for me. And they wheeled her away for surgery. The surgery went well and the doctor told me that if Sandy did not quit smoking, he would see us back in five years. As you know, your mom never quit smoking. And in 2001, six years later, she was back in the hospital with chest pain and another heart issue. This time the doctor went up through her leg and showed me on video where he had shot some medicine at the blockage in her heart and he cleared the blockage. Success. Well, not quite. They also found a blockage in the lower aorta in the Y as the blood vessels split and goes to each leg. This required another major surgery to replace that section of the aorta aorta with a artificial Y. Again, Sandy survived the surgery and was told she needed to quit smoking or she would, or it would eventually kill her. She was 47. One day I was taking a shower in the bathroom and I opened the window to let the steam out and I saw Sandy walking around our pool picking up stuff and smoking a cigarette. This upset me. She was hiding her smoking from me. She was supposed to quit smoking as she had not smoked in all those days in the hospital and had a good head start on quitting. I didn't say anything right away, but when I did confront her, she said, she tried, but just can't. Our relationship changed after this. I felt Sandy had given up and quit on me. I kept thinking if she doesn't stop smoking, she will die and I will be left alone. So I gave up on her. I started working longer hours, staying out very late after work with friends and just not caring. 
I didn't care if we stayed married anymore. And I made life very hard on her. I became distant, and we barely talked around the house. Oh, we had a relationship, and we did things together, but the love had gone. Sandy put it this way, I loved her, but I was not in love with her. I would never leave her, but I was hoping she'd leave me, and that never happened. In our sermon text from Genesis 32, 24 through 26, it says, So Jacob was alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob wrestled with God all night. I was a wrestler in high school and college. And our wrestling match was six minutes in high school and eight minutes in college. At the end of a match, you were spent, completely exhausted and physically drained. In a basic wrestling position, the man on the bottom does everything he can to escape. And the man on the top uses all his power to overpower the man on the bottom or just hang on for dear life. I cannot imagine wrestling with someone all night, let alone God. You would have to be totally committed to hang on that long. God said, let me go. And Jacob replied, I will not let you go until you bless me. That was Sandy. She would not give up on me and she would not let me go because she loved me. No matter what I did or the pain I caused her, she would not let me go. She never gave up. And God will not give up on you either because of his love for you. So as I'm reading the text, I say, what do you mean God won't give up? God was trying to escape the grasp of Jacob. God was trying to get away from Jacob. And finally had to wrench his hip and Jacob would still not let go. God's intention wasn't to get away. He wanted Jacob to fight for it. How bad did he want God in his life? The wrestling match is a struggle, just like your life is a struggle. God said when Adam sinned that our lives would be hard, just as Jacob, just as Jacob wanted to be blessed, so do we want to be blessed with eternal life in heaven. How bad do you want it? How hard will you fight to keep Jesus in your life? God had the power to defeat Jacob. He proved he had the power by just touching Jacob's hip and causing it to come out of joint. God wrestled Jacob as a man to show Jacob that he could overcome. We might consider our struggles in life as an opportunity that God has given us to demonstrate the character we have been developing. Regrettably, I failed that test. Not only did I give up on Sandy, I gave up on God. I didn't have Christ centered in my life and fell away from Sandy and God. Sandy, on the other hand, had the fortitude and the strength to never let go. And eventually, I came back around full circle. 
I started by coming back to church. God never gave up on me. Because he loves me. And I put Christ back in my life. Which led me to rebuild my relationship with your mother. I put my head in her lap with my arms around her and started sobbing about how sorry I was. She stroked my hair with her hand and forgave me. Where I was weak, your mother was strong, and she won the fight. I gave up one more time, but this time it was my heart. <laughs> this time it was my heart that I gave up to Sandy and God. God wants us to hold on to him, and he will never give up on us. Your mother and I did so many things together and traveled to so many places that they are too numerous to count. Sandy and I loved going to football games. We had season tickets, the Miami Dolphins, with a parking pass. Sandy loved to tailgate and sit in the sun. She was a people watcher. I often said when we go to the game, Sandy would watch the people and I would watch the game. We were also diehard University of Michigan football fans. For 35 years, we attended every Michigan bowl game in the state of Florida, except one. But we made up for missing that one game by traveling to Pasadena, California to watch Michigan play in the Rose Bowl in 2004. Our last game together was December 31st of this year. We had tickets and a parking bags to the Orange Bowl game to see Michigan play Georgia we got there just before the gate opened, and I got in early to start our tailgate and party with the fans. I can still see the smile on her face as she sat down in the chair, cracked open a Miller Lite, and with a big smile said, this is great. And this is the last picture I took of Sandy from our seats inside the stadium. We were so happy. The next day, New Year's Day, I had to take Sandy to the hospital emergency room. Her left leg was in pain and she couldn't walk. Because of COVID, they would not let me stay in her, in the emergency room with her. I thought about sleeping in the car to be close by but chose to go home and come back in the morning. The doctor called me before I could get to the hospital and told me that Sandy was a very sick woman and he had to do emergency surgery and he said he gave it a 30% chance of failure. When I got there, Sandy was alert and seemed fine except she had no blood flow to her leg. The doctor said the leg may have to come off, but he was going to try to save it. The doctor was very concerned because she had a weak heart. Just before they wheeled Sandy in for surgery, she pulled down her mask and pursed her lips, and we kissed. Being strong for Sandy, I said, don't worry, you're going to be fine. We've been through this before. The nurse said, it's time to go. And Sandy said, 
Let's do this thing. And I said, I'll be right here when you get back. That was January 2nd. On the morning of January 4th, after Pastor Tony and I prayed with her, God ripped her, ripped my heart out and took her from me. And I questioned, God, why did you take my best friend away? Why now, when our lives were going so good? I had only been retired for one year before you took her from me. I worked all those years so we could retire and enjoy our final years together. We were truly, truly in love. We held hands everywhere we went. We talked, we laughed, we traveled, and we had all these future plans. So why now? The Bible gives us the answer and is the resource for my answer. This next verse talks about being prepared for the second coming of Christ. But since Sandy is so long, longer with us, I'm, as you, I'm using it as being prepared for death. Along with four other verses I have chosen. Excuse me. First verse. You know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, 1 Thessalonians 5, and it did. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are, 1 John 3. And a favorite of all, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 16. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14. And the one that really gave me the answer from Romans 14, verse 8. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to God. Sandy did not belong to me. She belonged to God. Her body was worn out, her bones were breaking, her heart was weak, and it was discovered after her surgery that she only had one kidney. I think Sandy held on to me so tight for over 46 years as we wrestled with life that she just couldn't hang on any longer. She lost her grip and had to let me go. But God was with her and he never gives up. He held out his hand and lifted her up and he blessed her. with new life in heaven.
When I took my five-week Great American Adventure this past summer, I challenged myself to climb 1,400 feet up a mountain in Zion National Park. The view looking down at the halfway mark and then looking up at how much farther I had to go made me wonder, why? Why was I doing this? Being halfway up as I walked in a ravine between two mountain faces and approached my next upward climb, I had to keep stopping to catch my breath, wondering when the switchbacks on the path would end. And I forced myself to keep going. I was not going to quit. I was not going to give up until I reached the top. And the view from the top was breathtaking. And this is the path of our marriage. It was hard at times. The path was challenging. At times, Sandy would get ahead of me, and I would have to catch up. But we both made it to the top together. For better or worse, until death do us part. I tell you this, I will never give up again. I will never give up on God. And if I am blessed to find love again, I will never give up. Christ will be the center of my life. So to my children, today is the last day that I mourn for your mother. I am putting her memories here and your mother here in a special place in my heart. Sandy is part of me and I will never forget her. But now she has new life in the arms of Jesus in heaven, where there is no pain, no suffering, only happiness. So tonight, I will crack open one of Sandy's ice-cold Miller lights and raise a toast to her new life with Jesus in heaven and to my new life as I continue my walk with Jesus. Until we meet again in heaven. Amen. Amen.